One of those pieces was a video of a meteorologist that after the event went back and put together the weather pattern that day and how we ended up with a, what I'm told the technical term, a rain bomb event and how and where it came from and where we knew it was and where it was going. Uh, it was a meteorologist out of Houston. It was probably the clearest indicator of our weather pattern that day. So what I have uh, done is got that video. It is visible up there. The first 11 minutes or so, I think will set the stage for how the committee can go through the panels with a better perspective of just what this event was. And I'm hearing from the old timers, this is a 500 year plus event. When you get into the weeds of just how broad and how how um, big this rain cloud was and what it did. So with that, can you turn the video on? I'm meteorologist Pat Catlin here at KHOU in Houston, Texas. It's been a really rough week for folks in the Hill Country and Central Texas, especially the last few days with the prolific flooding that's happened through Kerrville and also in the Austin area. And it's left a lot of folks asking a lot of questions. This is an extreme event. It's a freak event, really. Uh, and so I think it's important that we take a minute to kind of break down why it happened, what the factors were that led to it, and what kind of advanced warning those that were in harm's way got leading up to this. So let's just kind of break this down. We're going to start first with why this prolific flooding event happened. And it all has to do with tropical moisture from Tropical Storm Barry. And you might be asking yourself, what tropical storm? We didn't have anything make landfall here in Texas. And that's correct. <laughs> tropical Storm Barry formed in the Gulf last week and ended up making landfall in northern Mexico. That moisture then moved up into Texas and interacted with a slow moving batch of storms over the middle of the state. Those two combined and pretty much happened over one of the worst parts of the state when it comes to flash flooding events, the hill country. We have all of these ravines and these creeks and these streams that kind of empty into bigger rivers. And that terrain helps to focus moisture and water all into one spot and you've got heavy training thunderstorms that occur in these areas flash flooding becomes a huge problem so let's take a look at how this uh, kind of panned out on a map this is the path that tropical storm barry took it formed in the bay of campeche and then kind of drifted into northern mexico and again wasn't an issue for anyone here in the united states in the days leading up to this Here's the problem though, even as the circulation associated with Tropical Storm Barry fell apart, all of that moisture in the atmosphere doesn't just disappear, it's still there. And notice you've got the Sierra Madre Mountains here through central and northern Mexico, uh, just off the coastline here. When you've got low level tropical moisture that comes onshore, it has to go somewhere. And it can't go up and over the mountains and so it starts to stream up north. And so you take all of that tropical moisture from this dissipating storm and you funnel it northward. Now typically this will lead to maybe a couple of days of unsettled weather, more clouds, a couple showers for us here in South Texas. What made this situation unique was the presence of what's known as a mesoscale convective vortex. It's basically a mini area of low pressure. And it was very slow moving, pretty much stationary over central Texas. Now forecasters knew that this MCV, mesoscale convective vortex, was going to be over the area about 12 to 18 hours before this event unfolded. And that'll go to the timeline. We'll talk about that in just a second. But once they saw this feature and they saw the interaction that was happening with that tropical moisture, that's when the first alarm bell started to go off. And again, we'll break down timeline in just a second. But when you marry that tropical moisture with this trigger for the development of thunderstorms, it just unleashed a freak event here across the hill country with slow moving, localized, prolific, heavy rain producing thunderstorms, first in the Kerrville area and then the days following up in the Austin area. So let's break down this timeline about what the forecasters knew and how they communicated this information to the public. <laughs> Thursday afternoon, so July 3rd, just afternoon, so 1.18 p.m. Central Time, 
flood watches were issued, and that did include the Kerrville area. Basically, a flood watch is the National Weather Service's way of saying, hey, conditions are possible for the potential to see flooding. It's not imminent, it's not happening right now, but within the next 24 hours, those conditions may start to develop. Later that evening, as the forecast started to become a little more clear, as more high resolution model data, which is what forecasters use to develop these forecasts, became more consistent, that's when they put out a special discussion about a flash flooding threat. So the messaging starts to become a little more specific Thursday evening. Now we get into the overnight hours and just after midnight, so 1 a.m. Friday, July 4th, is when thunderstorms begin to develop <coughs> right over Kerr County. And that's when the first flash flood warning is issued. This is a warning that is issued for stationary training heavy thunderstorms that are producing a tremendous amount of rainfall in a localized area that can lead to the development of rapidly rising floodwaters. Three hours later, at 4.03 in the morning, that's when that flash flood warning is upgraded to a rare flash flood emergency. Flash flood emergencies are reserved for the most significant types of flash flooding events. This is when there is an imminent ongoing threat to life and property and if you don't leave, your life is in danger. And so flash flood warnings are common through the hill country. Flash flood emergencies are that step above. That's a forecaster's way of saying this is a critical situation. 17 minutes later at 420 in the morning is when the Guadalupe River at Hunt hit that major flood stage and we know what happens after that. So here's a radar loop. This radar loop goes from one o'clock in the morning Friday all the way through Saturday evening. And you can see, notice that little spin, and I'll, I'll kind of segment this and break it up. But you see the spin on the radar there? That's the MCV, again, mesoscale convective vortex. Vortex is that word that really gives us that hint of that spin in the atmosphere. This is like a mini tropical storm almost over land because we're picking up tropical moisture from the remnants of Barry. You got that spin in the atmosphere, and this just becomes a, a, a self, you know, a, a self-serving engine basically. And so we see this just persistent rainfall across the hill country uh, for hours and hours and hours. We get a break, more develops here across the Austin area, and then it continues through Saturday and even during the day today on Sunday. Let's hone in on Friday specifically. We go from 1 a.m. all the way through the day. Here comes that swirl in the atmosphere. That's the MCV coming in. But before the MCV actually reaches the hill country, look what's happening over Kerrville. This one little training thunderstorm in here where it's rounds and rounds and rounds of heavy rain and then the MCV comes in. It was that initial thunderstorm that prompted the first flash flood warning. And as we kind of pause the clock here, 2.30 in the morning, remember that first flash flood warning came out just after 2 a.m., or actually just after 1 a.m., and this is the reason why. There was one lone thunderstorm right over the north and south fork of the Guadalupe River, and that's what prompted the initial flooding. Then you get the MCV coming in on top of that. Notice the spin there, and that's just kind of enhancing everything, enhancing thunderstorms, enhancing rainfall rates. It was the absolute perfect storm. And the problem that this, that this presents for forecasters on TV, at the government level, on the private sector, across the board, is that this is really pushing the science of meteorology to the limit. We are not at a point yet where we can pinpoint exactly where these thunderstorms are going to pop up and where that flooding is going to happen. But this was pretty much every worst case scenario coming to light, tropical moisture, uh, an MCV, and the terrain here, again, through the hill country, with all of these little ravines and creeks and streams kind of emptying into one big river. And so the, the, the flooding that we got just resulted from just hours and hours of relentless rainfall. So here, again, at the top of the Guadalupe River, so we're not even looking at the middle of the river, where it pretty much begins here, just outside of Kerrville, over a foot of rain fell. These are radar estimates. And this extended up towards Fredericksburg as well. And then when you just compound what happened in the days after, 
going up towards Marble Falls, Georgetown. Look at this, over 20 inches of rain. You got nearly two feet of rain uh, just to the south of Brady. So there were different pockets here. Notice these pockets of pink and magenta. Uh, this is where flash flooding was the worst. And this is what I was talking about where the science just isn't there yet. We are not at a point yet where we can identify where these individual pockets that lead to this life-threatening flash flooding can happen until pretty much it's starting to happen. So within about 30 minutes to an hour, the National Weather Service is going to see the trend and they're going to issue the warnings. But those warnings will only come with about 20 to 30 minutes of notice. We can't, you know, it's not at a point yet where we can give you a, a, a day's worth of notice uh, to get out of the way of these flooding events. Let's take a deeper dive into the, um, the terrain around the hill country and where this happened. So what I've highlighted here is the North Fork of the Guadalupe River. And what you've got you know, outside of that, you know, highlighted here in blue and white, these are little creeks and streams and tributaries that kind of feed into it. But this is the North Fork of the Guadalupe River. This is the South Fork of the Guadalupe River. And they meet in the town of Hunt. And remember, that flash flood emergency came in at 4, I believe it was 4.03 in the morning on Friday. And then at 4.20, 17 minutes later, the Guadalupe River here, where the two forks meet at Hunt, reached not minor, not moderate, but major flood stage. So it was just the perfect combination of conditions that led to heavy training thunderstorms over both forks of this major river that goes through the hill country and central Texas. And after that happened, you just got inundated. I mean, this magenta area here indicates that foot to 14 inches of rain that fell. And that rain came down on every creek and stream and tributary that eventually emptied into the Guadalupe River that flowed downstream through Ingram and then eventually into Kerrville. So that's this main river here. This is the Guadalupe River. And so you had all of this rain falling on all of these streams and creeks and tributaries. And that's what led to this catastrophic flooding event. And we're talking about a scale here of a few miles. And again, unfortunately, meteorology just isn't at the point yet where we can identify exactly where these isolated thunderstorms are going to pop up, especially when you come in in the middle of the night. Now, looking ahead, what does the forecast for this area look like for recovery operations, for cleanup? As we go through the rest of the overnight, we did have more thunderstorms out across this area today. All of that activity should start to die down. As we get into Monday, there could be more development here. The models are hinting that we could see a couple more showers getting into Monday morning. But I think the heaviest of this starts to push off towards the south and the west. As we go through the afternoon again, a couple spotty downpours are possible. But it doesn't look like it's going to be quite as widespread in coverage or as heavy as we've seen the last few days. Unfortunately, though, everything is so swollen and saturated from the last few days that it won't take much to exacerbate any um, rescue efforts and any cleanup efforts. So still another day or so of the spotty down. I, I hope that was informative. It was pretty well recapped and kind of how that stuff came together. Um, 